will call to order the meeting of the Board of Selectmen for Tuesday, June 5th, 2018. Previously, the Board met in the Executive Session to consider litigation strategy with respect to petition of Eversource Energy for Zoning Exemptions DPU. And um, now before we start our Pledge of Allegiance, we will open, as usual, with before we start our public session, we'll open with a Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I get the very first word in. I want to say congratulations to the Hopkinton High School class of 2018 who just graduated. So congratulations to all those students of ours. We're proud of you. And now um, we have our public session. Is there anyone who would like to come forward with public comments? Please. Your name and address. Good evening, Kevin Shea. 60 Pleasant Street. I have two things for you to consider. Uh, one, with the new elementary school opening up, that the speed limit goes from 20 to 40 to 20 within a very short space. And I'm not even sure you can enforce it with that differential where it's 40. So if there's anything you can do, I know it's a state road, but it would be nice if that was just 20 for that extended period. The second thing is, we'd like you to consider, I'm not sure if you can do this either, but banning smoking on the common in other public places. <coughs> Uh, I'm not a health advocate or anything, but I just don't want to get into an issue which the park ranger brought up at town meeting, which was there's a lot of people down there smoking all of a sudden, and what do you do about it? So you're going to have a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout or the baseball um, parade, and there's going to be people standing there smoking. So I think you get my drift. Mm -hmm. on that. Those were the two things I wanted to bring up. Thank you. I think there is a bit of an answer on the speed limit issue. This was brought up with discussion of the new elementary school and the traffic improvements and there's a bit of a conundrum for the town with needing, because it's a state road, to have, wasn't it a state survey or a, or a speed survey in order to change a speed limit? I can't remember the yeah, details, they will, but I know it seemed <coughs> to exactly your point. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense, but it's not within the town's purview to just change the speed limit. But there's a process which is a bit cumbersome, and are we in the midst of that? I think, or we'll look into that. Yeah, there is. There is a. But it being a state road, you have to go through a state process, and I think you have to be doing a, a traffic survey to judge average speeds and. And through the chair, if I may, get, get one, one of the issues is that uh, when the state does that test, that uh, if people are driving faster than 40 in those other areas, that they actually can raise the speed limit if the average speed is actually faster. So that was one of the scary parts about even looking at that study. And and we can only go 20 miles an hour at, at the end of the end of school's exit. The chief's here, too. but we're gonna we can. We can see what we can check with you too. Mm -hmm. Can come back and buy Jeff. I don't know if there's a, on the second part. I don't know if you're allowed to have to uh, smoke on town property or have tobacco on town property. We. I wonder if we have a police chief that might know the answer to that. Nearby. We can follow up. We can follow up. We'll follow yeah, up. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Definitely keep them off Pleasant Street, too. 
Is there anyone else? Don't be shy. No? Okay, fine. Well, thank you very much. And now we'll move to the consent agenda. There are three items on the um, consent agenda. Or is it four? I'm sorry. There's four items on the consent agenda. We can per, um, approve all four in, in a group if we so wish, or board members, if they have questions, can ask to pull out an individual item, and that can be voted separately. So <coughs> the items tonight are, number one, the Board of Selectmen will consider approving the May 22nd, 2018 Board of Selectmen minutes. Item two is a parade permit. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a parade permit from Aaron Nemzer, Director of the DMS Esports on behalf of the Jimmy Fun Walk on Sunday, September 23rd, 20, 2018. The walk will be the Boston Marathon course and will begin at Center School and extend into Ashland via East Main Street. Applicant is requesting a coned lane along the route Ash Street at East Main where there is no sidewalk, no full road closures requested, there is no rain date. Item three is also a parade permit. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a parade permit from Dan McIntyre on behalf of Parks and Recreation for the July 4th Horribles Parade. To be held on Wednesday, July 4th, the parade will begin and end at Hoppington Town Common. There is no rain date for this event. And finally, item four, a parade permit, temporary, a special temporary alcohol license. This is the Board of Selectmen will consider approving <clears throat> a parade permit and a special temporary alcohol license from Jack Nealon on behalf of the Live for Evan team for the 6th annual Evan and Girardi Memorial 5K Run Walk to be held on October 6, 2018 at 9 a.m. The start line will be at the Hopkinton High School Loop Road and will end at EMC Park. Would members like to pull any of these out um, for further Questions. I pull out four, please. All right, four. I'm good. I would like to ask a question on item two. So <coughs> we have consent agenda for the board minutes of May 22nd and the parade permit for the Horribles Parade. Motion to approve um, one and three. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. So the board minutes and the parade permit for the Horribles have been approved. Um, item two, parade permit for the Jimmy Fun Walk. Is Mr. Nemser here to speak to? You're representing him. Come up for a quick second, Ron. Thank you. Um, Ron. My, my question was, was, I had two questions. I, I guess we do this all the time. Um, it's, it's a familiar event. I was a little surprised at 2,300 participants, and it starts at 5.30 a.m., is that right? Yes. Is that, that seems really early. Is that the way it's gone? I mean, it's, that's it's, gone through the neighborhood. They've now. had a rolling start for the last five years. A prior, start. Prior to that, it's they had a, a start at seven o'clock, mm -hmm. and they opened registration at six. People would show up at six o'clock and just start walking. Okay. So, over time, they we basically said, let's just have it a rolling start so that we're prepared for people down course for the medical stops and the food and aid stations. Okay. So, five thirty, they can pick up the registration. And they start walking. Okay. So there's no neighborhood issues on a Sunday morning at five in the morning to be. It's worked okay. Yeah. All all of the uh, PA announcements are inside the gymnasium. All right. And so, how long is the entire walk? Twenty six point two miles. You're walking oh, from Hopkinton. I Boston. see. It's the whole course. I see. So we're just we're just our Hopkinton end. I, I understand. Okay. Um, my only other question is because the litter is is my gripe. Um, <clears throat> I know your statement, your uh, 
application mentioned that you would be overseeing cleanup of the Hopkinton Start area, and I suspect that you know, the Hopkinton Ashland is just the first leg, so probably there won't be much of anything in between Hopkinton and Ashland. Um, but I, I would request that, in addition to just the start area, that you do sweep the area. You do the sweep all the way to the top. After, line. afterwards, to make sure we clean up. That's correct. As much as possible, our own route. Um, okay, that is all that I had. Madam Chair, I move that we approve the parade permit for uh, the DMSC Sports. Jimmy Fund Walk on Sunday, September 23rd, 2018. Second. second. All right, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, unanimous. Thank, thank you very much. And lastly, item four the parade permit temporary alcohol license for um, the Evan Girardi run walk. Questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I think this is a great cause and I fully support it. The only question I have is with the uh, special temporary alcohol license. What I just want to make sure that it's everything's legal for us to sell whatever alcohol they're going to sell on school grounds or town grounds or whatever. If, that, the alcohol, so if you notice the rate, the route is reversed, uh -huh. the alcohol is not being sold on school property. Okay. But this, the finish line is at EMC Park. Okay. And we have approval of Parks and Rec already. Correct. Yeah. Well, then okay. I move to approve section four. Um, if I other just questions. ask one question. I'll second the motion, then you can ask the question. Sure. Um, so I see that the, it's supposed to start by 10 and ends at 1. Correct. Um, what are the hours that the alcohol is going to be served? That seems well, kind of early to the, start. In the alcohol permit is uh, 1030 to 1. Okay. So, you know, what will happen is 10 o'clock will go off. The last runners will come off at 11. We'll finish at EMC. Some of the fast people get there <laughs> pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And um, so the 1130 to 1 o'clock. Okay. So people who start drinking around 10.30, but you think more likely once they finish running? Definitely, yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, it's pretty common that at the end of a race, well, common, you see it frequently, a, a, a glass of beer at sure. the end of the race. Um, so it's just pure time. And we actually shifted the start time an hour from what we normally do mm -hmm. to get it up closer to, to noon as we could get it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I've never had a beer at the end of a race. However, I've never completed a race. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not too late to register. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you for the offer. <coughs> so. Well, I oh, just. Oh. oh no, you, go ahead. I'm done. Mr. Tetzrum, no? All set. Your just excellency. two things, Mike. I mean, this is just. We know what a great what a great cause this is, and how you guys have made so much lemonade out of, out of lemons basically for your family um, and and because of your success you know I'm seeing how high the numbers have gotten I'm sure you're aware of the comments that have come in from the fire department about the numbers getting up there so you are going to be 100% in coordination with yeah. fire and police yeah so we'll get on these numbers. We'll, we'll get on meeting agendas for um, officer Porter for chief Solomon and um, the request was to meet together. Yep. We always do it anyway. Um, we'll get on Porter's schedule and the Chiefs and, and do that. Sure. Said. The, yeah, the, the emergency so whatever, response. Whatever, you know, whatever is needed. In the past, we didn't need the EMT plan. We were mm -hmm. on the edge of it. But if, it, if it's deemed we need to do something, we'll do it. Chief, Chief will give you his input as to what he thinks yeah. should mm -hmm. should yeah. be safe. So looking it's, forward to it. So yeah. it's safer anyway. And because I seem to be the the trash lady these days again, <laughs> same comment that I had before. Uh, I know you mentioned checking the main areas, the loop, the water stop, and the EMC. Um, you know, do just make sure that you also do a sweep of the whole course so right. that um, yeah. you know we leave the places yeah. same way you found it. We'll do. So. We'll Absolutely. Do. I'm usually the last person to go uh, through it, so you have my personal yeah, assurance absolutely. that I will pick up the trash. Everybody can put their trash out and you can pick it up for them. <laughs> exactly. All right, all set? Mm -hmm. So I think we have a motion that has been made and seconded to approve the permit for the um, Evan and Girardi Main Memorial 5K Run Walk. 
All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. So moved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We're running a little early. That's a good thing. Um, we have this evening the honor of Mr. Jeffrey Liedman, who was the CEO of the Metro West Medical Center, Natick Framingham, and he has requested time on our agenda. Is he here, Mr. Liedman? Not yet. Okay. Well, then we'll then we'll we'll come back to that. Um, I think he didn't expect us to actually be running ahead of schedule. We have, uh, this was scheduled for 7.30, but it's not a public hearing, so um, a bond anticipation note renewal. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving and signing a bond anticipation note in the amount of $2,360,000 requested by Town Treasurer Michael Connolly. Mr. Connolly, can you explain this for us? Yes, good evening, everyone. Michael Connolly, Town Treasurer Collector. This is a bond anticipation note for three capital improvement projects, uh, the library construction, middle school auditorium, and the Grove Street water tank. Um, these projects are pretty much done, and this, this borrowing will cover the remaining portions of the expenses that, um, that are still owed on these projects. So this is to get us through the, you know, the end of the fiscal year. Um, so it's just standard operating procedure. This is a temporary borrowing. Um, it's, it's good for, it's a six month note. In December it'll come due and at that point in time, we'll see if there's any other, because there's ongoing projects as you know. Last town meeting there was more authorizations, but none of that can be done until after the new fiscal year. So my plan is to, uh, in December, roll this over with another temporary note with the hope to bring it through uh, um, the entire fiscal year. You know, my goal is not to have a bond issue in FY19 and just do a temporary borrowing so we won't have a bond issue until 2020. I've been here a little over two years. Uh, what was, uh, it was uh, two, two years on May, May 2nd. I walked in the door on May 2nd, 2016. We had a bond issue on May 16th. And then in December, we had another bond issue, so 16 million, 29 million. And then this past November, we had another $24 million bond issue. So that's three bonds we had in less than two years. So, um, so the hope now is to, uh, this temporary borrowing, as I said, will we'll get us through till December, then we'll roll it over, see what else has been spent between now and July 1st and December, and that'll get us through the end of the fiscal year with the hope. That's the plan. Okay. Are there any questions? Mr. Hurt. What is the rate for the borrowing, please? Yes. Did anybody get the, uh, the rate sheet? It was 1.90. Um, 1.9%. 1 Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Madam Chair, I move that the board approve the bond anticipation note uh, as requested by the Treasurer. Second. There's a specific language for the, the motion. On this. All right. Well, let me let me read the request, and you can make the motion. I request a motion to approve the sale of a two million three hundred and sixty thousand one point nine percent general obligation bond anticipation note. The note of the town dated June 12th, 2018, and payable December 12th, 2018, to Eastern Bank at par. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, it's unanimous. Okay, thank you. And we will sign that at the end of the meeting, I gather. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Good thank night. you, Michael. Um, has Mr. Liedman from Metro West arrived? No. Okay. Well, I think the trails at 192 Hayden Row, um, we probably have a number of people who want to attend that, so I think we should hold off on that one. 
Um, do we want to do board liaison reports? I guess there's nothing else to do right now. Mr. Hurd, do you have anything? I'm trying to think of what I've done since the last meeting specific for the town. Um, I don't think anything, I've gone to anything since our last meeting. It's that time of year. <laughs> so we have the, uh, on the elementary school building committee, we have the ribbon cutting Saturday, one to three at the new marathon school. Um, so from one till say two o'clock ish, there's going to be a, a, um, a bunch of speakers, um, Spilka, Dykema, those people will be there. Um, Mike Shepard, one of the uh, one of the people that was on the committee, one of the few people that were on the committee that actually went to center school. He's going to say a few words. There's another guy on that committee that went to center school that'll say a couple of quick words. Um, and then at two to three thirty, it's going to be there'll be tours, um, the honors student, the Hopkins High School honors student will be doing tours of the building. Um, so it'll be a fun event. There's going to be an ice cream truck there, and uh, free, free, free ice cream. Oh. Well, I mean, someone's going to pay for it, but it's not going to be the people <laughs> getting the ice cream. So uh, that's where we sit there. Sounds great. Mr. Nazarella, you don't have a liaison. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I was going to say, you we can't have easy to tonight. Please, uh, Mr. Catino. <laughs> Like Mr. Herr, I actually um, I did spent some downtime the last, <laughs> last two weeks. You mailed it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went on vacation. Nothing today. Okay. Well, I do have something, and I'll take this opportunity to promote it. Um, as you know, the Center School Reuse Advisory Team has been working on community input for what to do with center school once it is no longer a school, which is happening very quickly. And um, you may recall back in, I think it was February, they held a public forum for just general input on ideas. Since that time, the committee has been working with a variety of town boards, committees, departments, assessing their town needs. Um, there's a consistent theme coming out that there is a real need for space for many of our town offices and our town services. And so before everyone kind of disappears with the summer, the group is going to hold a public forum on June 13th at 7 o'clock right here in HCAM. It will also be broadcast with an update on the work of the committee, on the vision for Center School as it has been evolving. Um, that determination, of course, comes to this board, but the, t the team felt that it was time to update the townspeople as to where the process has, has been moving. Um, they are going to be partnering with EHOP. It's not an official EHOP event, but they are very good at doing community engagement, public input. Um, you know, they'll be taking live live messages on Facebook, on email, so you can, um, you know, text in your questions to the committee. So I hope that everybody either will watch it later on HCAM or ideally come to the live presentation to see where the process on finding a second life for Center School and the property has been has been heading. The board's been working since August and top priority is to get community involvement, community buy-in, um, make sure that this community asset serves the community in the best possible way. So put June 13th on your calendar. 7 p.m. and um, come if you can. So, has our gentleman from Metro West arrived? No, he has not. Madam Chair, just one other quick thing. All right. Well, we have a minute here. We were talking about briefly before the meeting started, but uh, I did stop into town hall the other day, not as official mm -hmm. liaison in any way, but just to check in on what's going on there, and it looks great. I would say it's 
94% done. Um, it's a lot of cosmetic finish up work now. And uh, I spoke with Dave, who actually was there at the time as well, the town engineer. Uh, I happened to run into him. And he felt, you know, like next month or so, we should get this thing wrapped up and get people back over there. So it looks really good. And I think the, the townspeople will be happy to know we're going back in and um, it should be fully functional I would definitely by the end of the summer. Mrs. Lazarus, can you give us a little update on, on the plan? Is there a target date now? I think you were saying that we're going to kind of move back in in stages. How's that going to work? Yes, departments will be going in stages. Dave is developing a plan for that. He's got a draft plan and working out the details. Um, so when he tells us to go, we'll go. Is there a target? By the end of the month. By the end of June? Sure. To, to start the move-in to or to complete, complete the move-in? That's, that's our plan. I think the man of the hour has been. Mr. Leaving. So <laughs> sorry, I've had a great tour of the town, though. Oh, no. <laughs> Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Just on time. Thanks. Well, good. Well, thank you. We're glad you're here. Um, we are honored tonight to have Mr. Jeffrey Liebman come speak with us. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Metro West Medical Center, Natick and Framingham. And he would like to update the Board of Selectmen and obviously all the townspeople who are watching at home on Metro West Medical Center's programs relative to the needs of the service area and their plans for improvements in coming years. So welcome, Mr. Liebman, and uh, we're happy to have you here. And happy for you to come speak with us about uh, what Metro West is, is doing for the, native, for the community. Yeah, so thank you for making time for me tonight. I've been here, although I've been running hospitals in Massachusetts for over 20 years, I've been in this role a little less than a year. And we've just gotten to the point now where I think it's time for me to go around and give you an update. I'd like to do this every six months or so, uh, so that you know where the hospital is, what we're planning, and sort of get your input because you are one of the eight to 10 towns that we service and have a strong community presence in and we think your input is very valuable to what we would plan in the future both short medium and long-term planning so i thought what i'd do tonight is just give you an overview of the hospital sort of where we are and where we're headed and then also tell you about a few things that will help us going forward as we work more collaboratively so first let me say that i'm sure a lot of you know about metro west if you don't it is it is a two-campus hospital in Framingham and Natick. We have four or five significant outpatient centers. Um, we uh, have a different philosophy than, a different, than some of the hospitals. We believe in what I call leading-edge care close to home. So it is our mission to develop more and more services locally. Uh, we believe we can continue to do that, and therefore people will be able to stay local for the services rather than have to travel into the town. We're about 11, one of our campuses is the closest one, probably 11 miles from Boston and 20 miles from Worcester. So again, our strategy, which you'll see in a minute, is simply we're going to continue to build and continue to grow. And to do that properly, we're going to need input from smart people like you that sit around the table. So this is our service area. Uh, you, you know, as many of you know, uh, Metro West Medical Center sort of, sort of serves that area that I call the Boston Marathon Run. You know, it starts here and then it goes to Ashland and Framingham and through Natick and all that. It's about 310,000 people. Uh, the green is our primary service area. The lighter colors are our secondary service area. Combined, this compounds for about 85% of our inpatient admissions, a little bit less on a percentage basis of our outpatient uh, admissions. So that number is actually wrong. You know, it's an old number. It's now more like 305 to 310,000 residents. As you know, significant growth here in Natick and other communities in the area. So again, licensed for about 307 beds. Uh, Framingham Union, Leonard Morse uh, are the two old hospitals. I've been around long enough that I still use those names. Uh, it was then merged into Metro West. And then we have a variety of outpatient locations that I won't go into. Um, we actually have two different types of campuses. So those critical care services, heart services, radiation therapy, oncology are mostly located in Framingham, closer here to here. And then the other, the behavioral health, more of the outpatient activities are in Natick. 
Uh, that is by design in many cases. Uh, we believe that we need a destination center for certain clinical outcomes that are important to us I'm going to share in a minute or two. And because of that, we've been able to provide actually better um, clinical outcomes in important areas like cardiac than any of the downtown hospitals. So this is how one campus is licensed, 72 med surge beds, 14 intensive care beds, pediatrics, OB. We have a growing OB program. Three or four years ago, we did about 750 deliveries. This year, we'll be able to do a little over 1,200. So the OB program in the nursery continues to grow fairly, fairly robustly. Leonard Morse is also a, a significant campus for us. Uh, that is where we have a slightly smaller medical surgical presence, but a significant presence in behavioral health. So we have 86 behavioral health beds. We believe that is the largest number of inpatient behavioral health beds uh, in all of New England in an acute care hospital setting. So we take care of some very high risk, high number, high acuity behavioral health. Because of that, we have intentionally stepped forward because we think it's on our mission to be front and center for the opioid crisis. So in our emergency rooms, where we do about 65,000 visits a year, in this one campus in Framingham last year, we discovered 400 people who were addicted to heroin that we were able to get into the program very quickly. Uh, we also sponsor the surrounding towns, not this one because we don't know of a task force like this. But in many surrounding towns, we provide resources in terms of <coughs> clinical expertise, administrative expertise, to form opioid task forces to try to get at that. Our behavioral health patients on the inpatient side is not the kind I used to see growing up in New York City. So growing up in New York City, I grew up in a neighborhood that's still not gentrified to tell you how bad it was. But um, the, you know, here what we see um, is the mom who, after a difficult delivery, got addicted to uh, some bad stuff. Or we see the 16-year-old who went to the wrong party, or the weekend warrior who couldn't get off of OxyContin for whatever reason. So a different type of inpatient setting. We are full pretty much all the time, though. Um, this is our array of services. So as you can see at Framingham Union, we have general med surge, intensive care, telemetry, labor and delivery infant operating rooms, significant number of outpatient services, our cardiac cath lab, which we'll talk about in a minute, which really serves both sides, a significant cancer center. We have clinical affiliations with pretty much all the Harvard teaching hospitals now. So in cancer, we have a clinical affiliation with Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, in um, OB and obstetrics, we have one with Tufts Medical Center downtown. We have significant others that I won't go into tonight but a full array of services, again, that, that we, uh, we provide. Uh, it, we also have a large uh, medical office building, uh, 61 Lincoln Street, which is a very large complex, lots of doctors there. And then on Leonard Morse, again, more of an adult behavioral health, child development unit, geriatric treatment on the behavioral health side, a sleep lab, a very important program in terms of our imaging and our emergency room. Of our 65,000 visits, about two-thirds are done in Framingham and one-third is done in Natick. And then we have a series of outpatient programs that circle the areas here. I just wanted to share with you sort of our, some of the clinical results because we've done a better job now because we sort of did surveys and responded to the needs of the patients. So if you look at our emergency rooms now, how many people walk in and walk out without being seen? That is a key indicator for us, because that tells us whether or not we're meeting the community need. So we are now down at 99% of the people who walk into Natick are serviced, taken care of, and either go home or get admitted, 98% in Framingham, which is a great number. It's much better than it was three, four, five years ago. We've put a lot of resources and efforts, so we're proud of that number. The goal near there is for us to be at 100%. We should never have someone who doesn't have a good experience and walks out the door before they're taken care of. I also wanted to give you one other to show you the kind of resource that you have locally. Um, statewide, the clinical standard for someone who has a heart attack and has to go to the cath lab. So this is from the time the ambulance delivers them to the hospital to into the cath lab where you hear all those fancy terms about running balloons and wires and saving their lives. So the statewide standard is 90 minutes, and that's pretty much the average. At Metro West Medical Center, no matter which emergency room you go to, we run on average 47 minutes. 
We've always been the best at this. We continue to be the best. And our shortest time, believe it or not, has been eight minutes, which we don't get to do often, but we actually get below 20 minutes more times than you would imagine. And the reason for that is we've set up systems so as you're coming to the hospital, the information sent to the emergency room, and if it looks like it's a heart problem, we're opening the cath lab on the way in. I won't go through all these major accomplishments. I'll, I'll just mention two. One is we were recently uh, identified uh, as a top 100 hospital by health grades. That means you're in the top 2% of the country. Um, that is a five-year study, and it's because we won awards in critical care, uh, cardiology, uh, gastroenterology, and two or three others. That is a five-year, again, longitudinal study, so we're very proud of that. The other is in July when the new Medicare ratings come out. So Medicare rates hospitals now from one to five stars. We will be listed as a four-star hospital, which is usually the top 15 or 20 percent of the country. I don't know the exact percentage because the new numbers haven't come up, but we have been notified we're going to be up to a four-star hospital, which is pretty good. And we have all these important things that we always win each year that I won't bore you with. Uh, we do have some great doctors. Uh, these are all listed as some of Boston's best. Um, they're really good doctors. I had one person on this at a different town we were talking to who said, you know, they're really good doctors. I don't think they're good looking enough, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, but these are really, really well qualified. Uh, we're very proud of our medical staff. Every year we usually have 20 to 30 doctors that are in this category. And I want to update you. So this is an old slide. We're going to be investing $12 million in uh, the hospital and its activities. Uh, that's between our serving the local communities. So the $12 million, about half of that will go into clinical equipment, things that we need to stay fresh and current. So and that's $6 million in that, about $6 million into upgrading the infrastructure to make the hospital just a better place. Uh, we are opening new services in behavioral health. In addition, we're recruiting 11 more doctors, our target this year. We're going to be opening uh, electroconvulsive therapy for those patients that need behavioral health. We started robotic surgery. We're putting in 3D MAMO into uh, many of our sites for um, mammography, people that need screening. And obviously, we still contribute a great deal of community support each year. To, we still do a lot of activities, and I would encourage you that we don't get as many requests from you as we do from other places. I don't know why that is. Um, I'm not here to say you shouldn't request it from us, but we do a lot of things, everything from the Doug Flutie run uh, all the way through a lot of other things that help. We're the corporate sponsor for the Framingham Y. We're the corporate sponsor for a lot of other, the, the Metro Best chamber with a corporate sponsor. So if there's things that we could help with that make sense, whether that be health fairs, supporting high schools, we would love to take your high school kids through and teach them about the opportunities in healthcare from a science perspective. Uh, we have 48 freestanding residents and fellows not tied to a medical school. These are our programs through the government. Um, and those people themselves, those young future doctors, they're already doctors, but when they finish their residency, hopefully they stay local because there's a shortage of primary care. Be glad to have them interact with any of the students that you want to, uh, to encourage. So um, everybody says, uh, you know, well, what could possibly go wrong? You know, every day I should get up and pinch myself because things are going so well. Uh, there are some things on the horizon that we worry about. Um, you know. There are some legislative initiatives that if things came to fruition would lead to a diminution or a difficult part in our bottom line that we have to cut back on. So again, I'm always going to come every six months and tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is not ugly, but they are storm clouds for us. So if things like this move forward, we would have to reconsider some of the support we give. People always ask me, well, Jeff, if you took a real difficult hit, if Medicare got cut, if there was forced legislation on you, what are those services that are probably at risk more than others? It's probably the ones, honestly, where we don't make any, you know, as, as much of a margin on because we couldn't afford to support them all. So there's behavioral health, there's the emergency room, there's some of the support activities we give to the local community. So um, a good example of that is there is a law that's being proposed going to the ballot. It is not only for Metro West, believe me, 
but there is going to be a ballot <coughs> initiative that could require an extra billion dollars be spent in the state. Um, it's, it's called the, the, uh, the fixed staffing ratio, if you will. You know, if that went through, this is an economic input. So this, these numbers are not ours. Uh, this comes from the Massachusetts Hospital Association. So we know our particular hit is about $15 million a year. Statewide, it looks like it's a billion or a billion three, depending on how you calculate it. Um, and we're just going to watch that closely. But, it, you know, when people ask me all the time, what can we use help with or get input on, it's really when we get to thorny questions of two things. One is how can we serve the community better? That's the most important thing to us. That is our mission, no matter what our tax status is. So we continue to be the largest employer in Framingham, probably the second largest in Natick, significant employer in all the surrounding towns because of our outpatient activities, and that's great. In addition to that, though, we still have a community mission to fulfill. We still have to support you in all the things that you need to, to do well. So with that, I should probably shut up and answer questions, if you have any. Thank you very much. Questions from the board? Mr. Herr. Um, you mentioned some concerns about legislative um, initiatives or things before the legislature. Have you had an opportunity to speak with Representative Dykema or Senator Spilka specific to those concerns? Uh, so uh, Senator Spilka is a great supporter of ours. Let me say she uses our hospital. She's terrific. You're lucky to have her right in the area. Um, we do, we have, uh, we do as a combined effort through Mass Hospital Association have had those conversations. We have some legislative people. Uh, one of my colleagues here is here tonight uh, who can fill you in on those details, but I'm not sure. Steve, can you answer that question better than me? Well, we're, we're waiting to meet with uh, Rep. Dykema, um, and uh, as you say, there's been a different approach to Senators Bill. But they're well aware of, of, the, of the issue, maybe not necessarily the impacts locally. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Liebman. It's nice to put your face to a, to a name. I work for uh, for Marianne Morse. Oh, sure. I'm the, um, I run the dementia unit there. Yeah. So I have a long, long time standing relationship with your GTU, uh, with Dr. Chen and Dr. Markowitz. Dr. Chen with the ACO, and Dr. Markowitz and Silverman in the uh, in the ICU. Yeah. So it's nice to put your face to the name I see all over the place. Um, <clears throat> I note that the one, one of the things that you guys do very well is morph to the community needs. Uh, like the GTU has changed some of its parameters as to, <clears throat> like you said, moving more towards the opioid crisis and a little bit less towards the, the geriatric, um, which, and, and I can vouch for the fact that you say that you're your place is generally full. Yeah. It's pretty hard to find a bed over there, and, and, yeah. and it's good for the bottom line, but you know it's kind of a tough reflection of society. Um, but uh, thank you for taking the time and coming in here, and um, kind of. So let me say, you're great neighbors. Uh, you, you really are. Really, I'd say we, the same to you. We, you know, you really are. And and also let me say that what we would like to do, when I get my feet on the ground a little more, so I've been there a little less than a year, is I'm trying to come up with a strategic plan that will say. We don't want to reduce the number of services to support a great institution like yours either. So we have to go through a planning process of how many more beds do we need licensed because we can't fill up with just one kind or another. We don't want to exclude any part of the community. So it's like I said before, I'd like to reach out to you, if you don't mind, and others here as you come up with those community needs because, believe it or not, we sad to say, sometimes I'm the last to know. I feel like the father joke, right? I'm the last to know. You see it before we do many times in these changing needs for the health care of the community. I would welcome any type of uh, communication moving forward. And Glad careful to. what you look ask for, because sometimes <laughs> you might find me on your doorstep. <laughs> and I'll tell Dr. Mark what you said. <laughs> Mr. Nazarula. I want to say thank you for, uh, for coming in and kind of updating on us on on everything that, that you've been do up to. Uh, one of the things that um, a particular concern to me is the, is the opioid crisis. Um, and I'm just curious as to, you know, what, what techniques do you really have to, to, help, uh, to help people and prevent 
the addiction just you know from the beginning? So that's a great question. First, let me say that the opioid crisis, this could take all night, but I'll try to give you well, yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but the opioid crisis is complex in these communities for several reasons. First of all, we have to train up our staff the right way. Mm -hmm. So we actually share training programs between us, the police, the fire departments, et cetera. So our staff are attuned to identifying people as they come in early on, because the earlier we catch it, the better. We don't want it to end up being on really bad stuff for a long time. And also so that we treat them in a respectful, clinical way, and we have the right attitude, because those are all inpatients or outpatients that need a lot of help. So we believe that the best thing is reaching out to the community and developing prevention programs by early identification of whether it be adults or kids who seem to be getting into trouble. We can't do that alone, so I tell everyone, our responsibility for healthcare does not end at the edge of our parking lot. We have to go out more in the community and provide more and more resources. That's where we get into these task forces we talked about. So we would be glad if you ever need a task force to bring in some expertise from us or the surrounding towns and help you set one up because I think, I think unless you catch it early, it's one of those things that can get out of control easily. And I, I say that having grown up and in a different part of the world in New York City, so, right. yeah. Mr. Catano. Thank you very much for coming in. You know, I, I, in this part of the country, we're just so blessed to have so many great institutions. Um, you know, especially here in here in Hopkinton, we've got uh, we've got you guys from Framingham that saved my father-in-law a few times, and and we've got. Um, Milford that yeah. saved my mother, my mother a few times and me once. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just so great, you know, within just a, a, a few minutes, you know, and that's what's you know, great for our, our EM, uh, EMTs and EMS here in, here in Hopkinton because they can radio ahead and find out who's got a spot open. And uh, I'm just, uh, just really happy that, that we have uh, both so very close to us. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, thank you again for coming in and, and bringing all this to, to the attention of the entire town. No, I'm glad. Again, we will be back if you don't mind from time to time. I, I don't want you to hear from us only when we need something. That's not a good relationship, number one. And number two, again, in more than 20 years of running hospitals in the Commonwealth, we or I seem to do a better job when I get direct input from people who have stepped forward to be formal and informal leaders in the community. Again, you're a lot closer many times to the constituency than we will be. So we know all the scientific stuff. We'll get you great doctors. We'll work with MHA and our partners like Milford Hospital and all that. But you're the ones who really live it every day, walk through it every day. And, and you know this community better than, I have a lot of people who live here and work for me, believe me, out of my 2,200 employees. But again, they don't sit, you have a unique vantage point in this, in this meeting. Well, thank you and um, Welcome to the neighborhood, so to speak. We hope that you will uh, enjoy and and um, you know find your time at Metro West fulfilling. I'm sure they're glad to have you. Uh, I have a real soft spot for for Framingham Union, shall we say? My husband a long time ago was an intern there. Oh, then go. he was a resident, and he was a chief resident. Um, he and uh, along with Dr. Rohit Jangi and Izzy Rosenberg, founded the infamous canoe race right. for the, are they still doing that? Uh -huh. Well, he's a, he's a founding father of the canoe race. Um, so. They do it outside my window, actually. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes, they dumped Dr. Rosenberg in the Learned Pond, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but. Um, thank you very much also for your offer about the opioid task force. Uh, there's not a community that isn't touched by that. Sure. And I, I think the thought of rather than waiting until it's crisis stage, getting out ahead of it, um, we have certainly been touched, not to the extent that other communities, but, but nobody's, been, nobody's been spared that. So I, that, that's a very generous offer. Um, I was wondering, a couple questions for you. The whole area has grown exponentially, Hopkinton in particular has been one of the fastest growing communities. Uh, are you finding and feeling that your facility, your number of beds in general, continues to be adequate for the region? So the number of inpatient beds continues to be because technology does more and more things on an outpatient mm -hmm. basis. 
-hmm. What we like to do, and I will do it with here if you feel it's appropriate, um, on those close-in communities, I meet on a regular basis with the fire chiefs and with the, some of the city planners to make sure that our emergency room services and our outpatient facilities are such that we're matching your growth patterns. Are we so, considered close in? Or it, no? well, you're sort of on the border, oh. but we will do that because, again, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here tonight is to say that we need to do joint community development planning when it comes to health care. So if you look at Natick, for example, they're talking about a 10-story building with, you know, for a 55 and above age group. Mm -hmm. uh, in downtown Framingham, they're talking about three or 400 new housing units. We need to be in that planning process and understand what's going to be, you know, how we can serve those populations as they move in. And as we become more of a destination location, whether that be for our intensive care unit or our neonatal nursery or whatever, we need to be able to make sure we've got communication vehicles back and forth to those new residents. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we will, we will add you to the list and be glad to, to help. And we'll obviously coordinate with other local healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. We're here really to do it in, again, becoming a destination because of our CAF programs and some of our higher level work that we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, just Hockington, with new development in recent years, we've increased our population by probably 20%. Just with I, new housing in the last couple of years. Right. So let me give you a simple example. As that goes up, A, we've got to be prepared with all the right EMS and ambulance people. B, we've got to learn, did the road development match the growth, and are they going to have more difficult getting to the cath lab or not? Mm. So how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, what can we do in the, in the outside world? So there's some communities where we're going to be partnering and teaching people to actually, through some of the EMS, give Narcan, if you know what that is, for the opioid yes, crisis yes. Save there. Two lives in this town. Right. So, so you know, and, and we're trying to partner also with the high school students and things like that. What are the needs of the kids as they grow up? And again, creating jobs as well as creating a healthcare environment and a community where they want to stay. So those 88 beds, I think you said that were site beds in 86, Leonard, 86 um, which seems like a lot. Are those filled by local, or do you take from other hospitals, or do you find that that actually oh, is, is consumed by the local population? It's local. It is. Yeah. Yes, it's, I mean, local being that map I showed you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not like you No, know, no. So there are some other, things other that areas. we don't look to be a destination center because the community need fills it up completely. Wow. Uh, there are others we can stretch further because with robotic surgery and things, you can get patients in and out faster. Mm -hmm. But we will continue to add, and that's another part of the planning process, right? Mm -hmm. So if we knew there was a... If we knew there was a problem, say, in the high school with right. some of these issues, we would set up referral lines. Mm -hmm that the school nurse or the school itself could call if they think they're having, they need some advice or some referral sources. I just, one more question, I don't mean well, to please. belabor the point, but when you went through all those legislative issues, um, you mentioned one possible hot topic was the, sta the staff ratio thing. I was just wondering, um, how does Metro West staffing compare right now to others? Um, yeah. you know, so we, we staff pretty well. We don't have any issues or problems. We're, there's two parts to the legislation. One is, if it passed as written today, it would say that if I had an inpatient unit right now, say in Natick or Framingham, mm -hmm. it's not too busy, but three ambulances pull up to the emergency room. This legislation says I can't take nurses from the inpatient units to run downstairs to help the emergency room. Okay, you're literally locked in. You have to only be within the same unit. That's a problem. The other, believe it or not, strange thing is that we don't have enough psych nurses in this state. So right now, if I wanted to grow or if I wanted to live up to it, there would be days that if I didn't have enough psych nurses because somebody called in sick, I would have to close behavioral health beds. And at the same time, you'd have to have staffing in position for the patients that might come in or they might not, and Correct. then they're standing around. Correct. Physically. Yeah. So that's one of your concerns. Are there any other legislative um, concerns out there that seem likely oh, yeah. to come down the road? Well, I think there's going to be a whole debate about hospital reimbursement. So if you read The Globe over the weekend, you will see that some of the hospitals that serve you, us, 
Milford. You know, I used to run Good Sam in Brockton, so I know that place. And I used to run D.I.D. Needham over 20 years. I, I know these places. You know, as we're compensated significantly less than the downtown institutions, it's going to be harder and harder to build the kind of facilities that you all deserve. It's that simple. And, you know, if you want, you should read that article. Kim Holland, I think, did a nice job explaining things from a community hospital perspective. Uh, but it's, I think it was the Saturday Boston Globe or Sunday. I think it was Saturday. But you, you would see that that is, you know, that is a concern. The other concern, candidly, is, you know, this legislation, the first one we talked about, cuts across all types of hospitals. It doesn't matter if it's rehab, acute care, behavioral health, et cetera. So it's going to create a demand, and a lot of the downtown institutions might be pulling nurses out of the local community because they're just bigger and better financed. So they might actually have to pull nurses instead of the balance we have now. Well, I'm glad to see you still have your residency program and you're still a teaching hospital. That that's a, plays a big role, I know, in bringing physicians, particularly primary care, into the community and, and staying here. We're so. very proud of those 48 residents. So. So. Thank you all for giving me the time. I appreciate it. Thank you for it. coming Thank you. And, and I will follow to us. Dr. Mark, what's your you text at her? She gives you two thumbs up. So <laughs> <laughs> She's only got two. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank well, you so thank much. You thank you so thanks. much, Mr. Leadman. Appreciate your time. We're running a little ahead of schedule, but not too much. Um, we have next on the agenda are the trails at 192 Hayden Row, uh, also known as the Hughes property. And this meeting has been requested by the residents of the Blackthorn Circle Deer Run neighborhood. The Board of Selectmen will discuss neighborhood concerns relative to the installation of trails on the former Hughes property owned by the town of Hopkinton and connecting to Deer Run. So I am assuming some of the Deer Run, our Deer Run resident is here and I noticed Mr. Lagoy who's working on the trails. I saw him somewhere. There he is. He's here. So good evening, sir. Hello. And you are? Eric Krajewski, Nine Blackthorn Circle. Thank you for coming. And I'm, thank you. I'm not really familiar with the process, so if I do things wrong, just redirect me, please. I have some handouts. May I share them with you? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So our biggest concern is safety, so I was glad to hear about the hospital uh, presentation right before ours. <laughs> so there are really uh, three things that we're looking for today. We're concerned about the safety and character of our neighborhood. It seems like neighbors should have a say in what happens, or at least some input, and we haven't. Um, so we're looking for three things. We're looking for... Uh, well, the first one is we ask that you formalize a hold on the what we're calling the Deer Run Spur, which is a trail um, that would connect Deer Run to, to the cart path on the um, Hughes property. We did have a meeting yesterday with the town manager, um, the Trails Club, and we did come to an agreement that that would be put on hold until we can get through the process, so that's a good thing. But in the process, we also found that uh, it would very, be very confusing as to how trails get planned and implemented in town. Uh, who decides where they go and um, you know, what input is there from the residents and what input is there from public safety. And, um, oh, and the third thing that I'd be looking for is, based on what we're expressing as our concerns, um, we're looking for guidance as to how we should move forward. So. First question would be, why do we need a dirt trail connecting Deer Run? And, um, you know, on one hand, it could be, you know, the, the word connectivity. You know, if you're against connectivity, um, you're a fascist. Well, no. There's connectivity is one thing, and um, thoroughfare is a completely other animal. So if there's a trail that's letting us get to center trail and, and be able to um, 
go to Charles View or wherever, that's one thing. But when the plan is that a trail would potentially connect Echo Trail through Deer Run across Granite Street, um, then to Joseph Road and through Charles View to get the center trail, you're going by 100 houses. So um, that doesn't seem right, um, but we're gonna talk about some other issues related to that. So I'm not gonna go through every point, but if you get to the first map picture, and I'm, I apologize that the green did not print out better, but what you'll see is the yellow is the Echo Trail. And I'm, not, I'm actually talking about the handout first map. So the, so, so the yellow is Echo Trail. Then you see multiple green trails. You see a green trail going up Hayden Row back into the Hughes property. You see another one going up Deer Run into the Hughes, former Hughes property. Um, and then you see that the trail is connecting to Joseph Road. So that's what's, that's what's being basically proposed. When we discussed this yesterday, um, the Trails Club agreed to explore whether they can do all their construction without coming through Deer Run, because that seemed to be a, a late discovery that he wanted to be able to move equipment in there to, to do some of the work. So uh, it seemed like a reasonable alternative that they may be able to use the Hayden Row access and not really need the Deer Run access. If you go to the next page, there's another green line, which is uh, phase seven, a, an option of phase seven of the Hopkins Upper Charles Trail Committee which was presented to the Board of Selectmen over the last year. So now you see there's another trail that would go behind our houses. And quite frankly, that one is the one that affects me the most directly. And I don't care about it because that was, that's being proposed in a way that's less obtrusive to the neighborhood. It's not forcing people to ride through or walk or jog through our neighborhood. Um, so, but, but the point is that you see three different trail options and one going full steam ahead. Um, which, by the way, it shouldn't because there shouldn't be any work done on the Hughes property until the dog park plan is approved. That was part of the funding that they received last year. The next slide is really just showing the uh, what Hoppington, and this was another thing that we learned, like, well, which trails committee or which trails club are you talking about? So when you see the four, phase four overall approach, this is just showing that there is a plan underway by the Hopkins Upper Charles Trail Committee to somehow connect from the Milford Trail to get to basically the, uh, the head end of Echo Trail near at Granite Street. So one way or another, the plan is to bring, um, in phase four, to bring the uh, Upper Charles Trail over to there. Next slide is just really the fact that at least the Hop Number Charles Cheryl Committee has some guidelines as to being non-invasive into neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like th these kinds of guidelines should be formalized and extended to all trails working town, mm -hmm. is our belief. If we jump to the parking, there's, a, there's already a significant parking problem on Deer Run related to the use of Echo Lake for fishing, partying, and so on. And there's a significant amount of trash and vandalism. And the construction of Echo Trail has actually made Echo Lake more inviting. And um, as a matter of fact, there was a decision made recently by the Board of Selectmen to put no parking signs on granite. Well, why is that required? I can only guess that it's required because you expect more people to park there because it's more inviting. So then the next question is, well, if the cars aren't parking there and they don't fit in the two lots in front of the cemetery, which questionable whether they should park there, or the two spots that were built on Echo Trail, which also I don't know if that was ever really approved. But where would you go if those are all taken? You'll go to Deer Run. You'll park in Deer Run. Um, so I do, I do wonder, and it'd be nice to see if public safety could comment on what the thoughts are of having uh, it increased traffic and trails, and was there any kind of traffic study done in the area? Another point then is impact to the neighborhood, and it's um, so it's, it's it's a matter of this pass through traffic of the idea that it's not just a uh, connector for connectivity, but it's really a thoroughfare. Um, so we expect more parking litter and vandalism. There is a safety cam that was already installed at the end of Deer Run, but I believe it's no longer working. Um, 
and then there are unintended consequences. So if we didn't speak up now, the trail would have been in probably within a couple of days, is my belief, and as soon as it's approved by CONCOM. And then once you cut the trees down, you're gonna wait 30 years from the grow back. So that's why we were asking uh, for, for quick action on this. But also unintended consequences of, well, property values, or let's say we put in a small trail now, but then it becomes a huge trail later. You know, it, it, we just are concerned. But most importantly is safety. And rather than me talk to safety, I'd like uh, Gene Tagney, my neighbor, to, to cover that one. Hi everyone, I'm Jean Papagni. I live at 7 Blackthorn Circle. Um, there are a few points that I wanted to address specifically and I was asked to speak to this point. Um, I've lived in Hopkinton for uh, over 24 years and I have two daughters, one of whom is a young adult with Down syndrome. When we moved to this neighborhood, we moved specifically to have a contained, safe, quiet place for Kara to learn, to grow, to expand, and to build all of her skills. It's of imperative importance for us and for me as a, in our family and as this neighborhood to maintain the character and the safety of our neighborhood. So having this, if you look at that map, you'll see that Blackthorn Circle, you, I'm sure most of you already know, it's a, it's a closed loop circle and it is a very safe place for Kara and others to learn and to ride bikes and to take walks with pets. Um, we have, in addition to Kara having Down syndrome, we also have another resident in our neighborhood who is a young <coughs> adult male with autism. We have five toddlers and we have two babies on the way. And we, all of us are accessing our circle in a way that is safe for our families currently. The neighborhood was desi is designed in a way that makes it very easy for us to navigate and easy for my daughter to increase her community navigation skills, which is so critical for her safety and her development. At 20, she continues to struggle with many of the basic requirements for her to navigate. She needs a safe and quiet location to do this, and this has served us very well over the years. If the trail is built directly inside our protected neighborhood, the health and safety of these vulnerable residents will be compromised. And the influx of traffic up for, to access the trail will be dangerous overall. Additionally, we'll be dealing with a significant increase in cars parking on our streets for those accessing the trails, including the local teens who are accessing Echo Lake illegally and leaving their trash behind and numerous vandalism incidents that we have been noting over the years. This has been an issue now for many years and will continue to get worse as the Trails Club recently created the access to Echo Lake, inviting, creating that a more inviting at atmosphere to access the lake. Neither did Peter Lagoy or the Trails Club give any consideration to the actual specialized needs and desires of the taxpaying residents of a neighborhood they decided is best suited for this trail connector without our intent. Input, without our input. Nor did they bother to ask the residents of Deer Run and Blackthorn Circle, the ones most affected by this trail connector, if we viewed this trail as a benefit rather than just assuming we would want it. We believe it's our right as homeowners and taxpayers in this town to be consulted and considered regarding projects that could adversely affect the health and safety of our residents, particularly our most vulnerable residents. Thank you. Thank you. So again, I'm not familiar with the formal process, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap up with, so we were asking for three things. We're asking you to implement, consider implementing a process to be followed for proposing, approving, and constructing new trails in town, regardless of whether it's by the trails club or a trails committee. We ask you to formalize putting on hold the deer run trail spur until it's approved by the selectmen which is what we agreed to in a meeting yesterday with the Trails Club and with Elaine and with, um, with Norman, the town manager. So we're just asking you to formalize something that was agreed to by the parties. And, um, and we're asking you for advice as to how we should proceed to go forward. Okay. Thank you. 
Well, I will open it up to questions, but I, I will just generally say I agree with a lot of what you say, and you know, I, I think that um, the good that comes out of this is it's brought this to our attention as a community that there needs to be a different process, um, particularly when there are public assets that are being developed that will be part of our, of our town, um, you know, our, our town assets. So I think it's, it's a good thing that we're having this discussion. Um, personally, I am always a great believer of finding middle ground that meets the needs on both sides, and more often than not, there is, there is a way to that, and I think some of that has already happened. Um, so I want to open it up to other members of the board first for, for questions and comments. Um, I've been picking on this side of the table, so I'll start with Mr. Nazrula, if you, if you wish. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So I actually took a drive up there um, today before I came over here. And um, just to get a sense of it, and it certainly appears as though the trailhead is going through lawn in order to get to the, get to the trails. Um, what exactly has been the experience? Um, people parking there and then hiking through the lawns and it, that is not an existing trail. It is used by several people. It is town property, and right. some people do use it as a cut through, which I assume they're entitled to do. That's not the concern. The concern is that they want to take 10 to 20 dump truck loads full of material up there to create trails on the, um, on the walking paths on the Hughes property. And um, so that's, that's the concern is that uh, that if it was left the way it is, there's no issue. What was being proposed was to create an ADA compliant path. We also saw other plans for parking at the end of deer run. Um, so it's unnecessary, that's what we're saying. So what agreement we came to yesterday was there is an access option from uh, Hayden Row and um, and, and the Trails Club agreed to look at that to see if they can do what they need by going to that access, which would be fine with us. We have no issue with trails back there. We're just trying to not make it a thoroughfare for the Upper Charles Trail. Sure. It seems to me as though it would be advantageous um, for the community, uh, for your specific community, to actually have a trailhead there, so long as we didn't have these few bad apples that were you know, go trying to access Echo Lake and creating problems that way. As far as creating a, you know, the uh, the material for creating the trails, I mean, wouldn't that eventually get spread out and? No, actually, issues? actually, it's very confusing to me. And maybe Peter Logoy can comment on because that came out late in our meeting yesterday because mm -hmm. we were actually, he was suggesting maybe just through use it'll become a, a path which of course would not need to be that would be passive recreation it would not need to be made ada compliant and maybe there's a path that ends up being there and what we agreed to yesterday was well let's defer formalizing anything there until he can explore whether the hayden row access will work mm -hmm. and peter's one hesitation to that was which to find this out at the end of the meeting was kind of shocking was that he, he wanted to be able to get equipment back there through Deer Run. And our question was, if you have right away at Joseph Road, why not go in through Joseph Road? If you have right away at Hayden Row, why not go in there? And I guess there are some cost concerns and there are some wetlands concerns, just as there are wetland concerns of going through Deer Run. Thank you. So I'm a member of the Upper Charles Trails Committee. And one of the issues that, and, and, and the Upper Charles Trails Committee is mandated to to do a hookup so that we can eventually hook up into uh, into Milford and come right up through and, and hook into Ashland, so that um, so that people don't have to use cars all the time. People can walk walk, walk the town. One of the one of the benefits uh, of Hopkinton Hopkins is considered a very walkable community because of our trail network. Where we ran into problems is is years ago Milford took over their rail trail. And it was very easy for them to to put up their, their trail because they had a 66 foot wide uh, swath that they could they could do anything with. 
Hopkinton had some people legally and illegally take over parts of it. And then a couple years ago, the, the federal government said that uh, if you're on a trail spur, you can you automatically own it. So Hopkinton lost out on that. And so what the Upper Charles Trails Committee has been doing is trying to buy these little little plots and then trying to make a path somehow, some way of, of getting from Ashland to Milford. And it's you know it's one of these things that's it's taken I don't know they've been on there six or seven years already, and it still looks like it's several years out before we can actually have some kind of connectivity. It's keeping in mind staying away from staying away from neighborhoods that don't want us that don't want the trail there, getting close to neighborhoods that do want it there, but the the trail is nothing like the one that they have in Milford, which is straight and it cuts across a couple of streets. This one has to cut across and cut across 85, and then go back and cut back across 85, and um, and, and it's all all been based on where the town can buy land, and um, you know, and and you know, having you come up and and, you know, and and talk about this stuff is important, you know, and that's why if we have enough connectivity, you know, there doesn't need to be people parking on Deer Run. It doesn't need to have. We don't need to have people parking on. On Granite Street, you know, with the, the, a a larger parking lot could be made somewhere near the entrance to the Center Trail now, or some or or, or at some other spots when we do the um, downtown um, uh, renovation project. So you know, it, it, it's it, it's a it's a um, uh, it's a moving target. It's 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 really tough in order to meet that mandate and then meet the needs of the entire community because the entire community has has been screaming for a, a connected trails network, you know all this all this work and we you know we have the center trail that's growing, you know before it was just one little small piece and now it's now we have it attached right through to the high school and that's gone past the high school a little bit then it's but then it's stopped because we can't figure out which way to go, you know and here now now here we have the a, another entrance. Coming from Hayden Road, where there can be parking there, but to to you know to Ms. Nazrula's point, you know to to have a um, an endpoint that comes into Deer Run, I, you know I, I I would think that that would be a benefit to the neighborhood to some extent, so that people could so kids could walk right through the trail and get right to the right to the elementary school. May I comment to that? Oh, absolutely. I agree completely. If it was an endpoint. But that's not the plan. That's not Peter's plan. Peter's plan is that when you come out Echo Trail, you'll take a left, and then you'll take a right on the Deer Run, and you'll continue on through until you eventually get the Center Trail. So I agree completely. If it was an endpoint, no problem. You've actually outlined in your discussion exactly what our concern is, which is Upper Charles Trail is not sure how they're going to connect. And so therefore, um, while you're figuring that out and while you're buying land, guess where they're going to go? Going to go, if, if this trail is put in through from Deer Run connecting to Joseph, where that traffic is going to go is through our neighborhood and through Charlesview. That's our concern. Well, there wouldn't be any car traffic. There would be just people walking. Uh, first of all, it would be first of all, it's a thoroughfare, not an endpoint, right? So therefore, it's traffic coming from Milford Trails. It's people. If it's fully connected, it, it becomes the de facto Upper Charles Trail. People will park in our neighborhood to get access to the trail because it's a because it's not an endpoint; it's an intermediate point. So, so either it's an endpoint or it's a thoroughfare. That's the that's the sub. That, I think that's the essence of the concern. Well, you, as you know, the the Milford Trail, um, where, where it starts just after the uh, Hopkinton line, there's a large parking lot. That's why I always go with my I always went with my children, yeah. and we took our bikes off there and we ran all through all through Milford and then came back. You know, so and I took a picture there this we didn't, weekend. You know, we didn't bring the car, if, if I may, we didn't bring the car halfway and say we're going to start here and then go this way and then go this way. We and so 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 say that that people would would drive down down the the street. You know, basically what the upper tra you know the upper Charles Trails Committee is doing is trying to find a way that works to 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 Ms. Wright's point. Um, find a way that works with everybody. So are you saying that the Upper Charles Trail Committee does want to use Deer Run as a thoroughfare? Does? Yeah, are you saying that you no, do? The, the, I, I, That's what I heard you say, though, that's all. Well, that, 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 was, that was one of the possibilities. 
that there was that. But then, that's what but we're here representing one against. The, one of the, you know, uh, um, but there's also the possibility of we always wanted to try and do it on the other side of the street. That's why we bought the Irvine Tadaro property. All, all, all the properties that the town buys at town meeting, people say, is there, are there going to be trails to it? Yes, there are going to be trails to it. And, and everybody always, they're always asking, with, with Legacy Farms, one of the biggest things we did with Legacy Farms was to make sure that they were going to have miles of trails going all around through Legacy Farms. You know, and so that's one of the things that people are screaming for in the town, but I'm, I'm sure that there's a way that, that it can all be worked out and, and um, to, to everybody's uh, uh, happiness. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to keep your comments through the chair. Oh, I'm sorry. May we move to Mr. Herr? Mm. Hi. Um, so thanks to everyone for coming back tonight. I know when you first came in and we wanted to have a little dialogue during the public session, there was a little confusion perhaps. I got a couple of questions afterwards about why we can't have certain things go on at certain times. So just real quick, open meeting law, where it's a public meeting, the public gets to see it, the public by law does not necessarily get to participate in it. That's one thing. Okay, it's a public hearing, it's a different matter than you get to participate by law. Two, when we have public comment and the public comes up with an issue and wants to get into it at the moment, we can't get into it at the moment even if it's a legit issue because it's not been posted on the agenda. And therefore the public hasn't been notified that that's going to happen at a public meeting and therefore it's a violation of the open meeting law. So we get input at, open, at public comment, but we can't deliberate, we can't do this like we're doing tonight. And that's why we kind of had to sort of hold off until tonight. So thanks for coming back tonight and your patience uh, getting here. Uh, secondly, uh, Peter Legoy uh, and his friends have done amazing work for Hockington. I thought I saw Peter here earlier. Uh, there he is. So, and, and he doesn't have a, uh, uh, an evil bone in his body. He's trying to just make the trails work in Hockington. Uh, and I think he's done a fabulous job on behalf of the community uh, on some official properties in town and perhaps an official trail work sometimes and you know good old Hopkinton from 30 years ago perhaps some unofficial trails that basically got formed over time that he's also helped clean up so uh, and we've all been sort of watching that and part of that so if anyone's to blame for the trail situation in Hopkinton in my view it is the board of selectmen's plural meaning us our predecessors and perhaps some future folks if we don't do something different because to your folks point we absolutely have to fix this process it's not managed well and I agree with you on that hundred percent We've tried to do some of this with the Upper Charles Trails Committee. And we appointed them uh, three or four years ago now, <clears throat> 10 years ago? Nine. Nine. I don't know if it was that long ago, because I've been around 10, so it wasn't, it was the middle of my time. Anyway, we appointed a group, and we gave them a very specific charge. And even that wasn't very well organized and sort of directed to them, because they came back confused a few times. Uh, and so we, it was obvious to us that their trail situation with a official committee in town was not doing as well as we thought it could do, not because the people weren't trying and they weren't great people, but because the charge from the Board of Selectmen at the time uh, was not very clear. So I, I personally think that the process for trail development and management in Hopkinton continues to be a problem. And I don't know sitting here tonight what the answer is. Uh, I do know our role is not to figure out whether we're taking a left or a right turn at what trail intersection and what color the, the surface the, 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 the trail is going to be. But I, I, our role is to have processes and procedures and policies in town that work on behalf of the citizens. And I don't think our trail situation overall, and Peter will probably back me up on this, is that well managed and organized from a town-wide perspective. I would love to know who takes care of the trails, besides Peter, who I know volunteers and runs down there all the time, behind the neighborhood I live up on the west side of town. I don't know. That's a problem, that I don't know the answer to that question. And I think that's another symptom of the issue you folks are raising, which uh, I share your concern about. So um, I don't know what the answer is. I do know that we have to fix the process. And so I just want to answer your questions directly. Um, implement a process for proposing, improving, constructing new trails. Yeah, we don't have that process and we need to figure that out. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, formalize a hold on Deer Run Trail Spur until approved by Selectman. Uh, I don't even know if we have the authority to do that, so we can talk about that a little bit further. And we ask for guidance on how we should move forward. One of the things you absolutely should do is keep pressure on the Board of Selectmen 
uh, and the planning board and others in town to get our heads around how we're going to manage trails going forward. Uh, I think a lot of this is also symptomatic of the growth in town. You know, 30 years ago, a trail could kind of pop up. People could go for a run, go for a walk. Next thing you know, it becomes a trail. No one cares. No one's around. It's not near any neighborhoods. But as the town has grown, as we've gotten a little bit denser, uh, I think the pressures have increased dramatically. So uh, it's not surprising to me that we are here where we are. But I do think our job is to come up with a process that's going to work town-wide. I think we've got to, like we did with Upper Charles Trails, expand that and go a whole level, level above that and, and figure out through, and not tonight, but figure out through Mr. Kamalo, Ms. Lazarus, what other communities do that have great trail networks, how they manage those, what we should be doing different here in Hockington, and come back not only to ourselves, and to the residents that are concerned, but also the town meeting, which would be my last point, folks. A lot of stuff goes on at town meeting. We always talk about trails at town meetings when we're buying property, to Mr. Contino's point. And the Hughes property, there was a big debate about buying it, and there was a lot of discussion about trails, as was the Sodaro Irvine property, as was the Pratt property, as a lot of other land that we've bought in recent years. So, you know, keeping the pressure on us uh, going forward here for the next year or two to fix this, and keeping the pressure on, on all of us in the community through town meeting participation, I think, would really help, too. So with that, uh, I would suggest uh, that tonight we try to start a process to get the trails of Hopkinton under control. And I don't know what that is other than perhaps some kind of uh, um, task for, for the town manager's office to figure out how really well, how really strong communities with great trail networks, how they manage their, their trails, and kind of come back to us with some ideas. Because it's we've been floundering on this thing for years. And I don't know if it's been nine years or not, John, but we've been doing this. You know, I, I've said a few times, if we talk about trails in Hockington, we don't, we don't have a really good conversation because we, we all get frustrated. If we talk about tree removal in Hockington and tree management in Hockington, and there was a nice little letter in the paper the other day about that. We always get frustrated in town and we don't do very well for whatever reason, trees. So trails, trees, and trash. Whenever we talk about trash contracts, changing how we pick up trash, recycling, it always turns into a bit of a, a, a fiasco for whatever reason. So we gotta fix that and I think that's our responsibility and I really appreciate you guys coming in here and saying enough's enough, let's get it figured out. In the short term, we gotta talk about whether we should be doing this deer run trail to your meeting yesterday or not that's, that's all i have for now and that's why i said i think this is a good thing because it's brought this to the service because mm -hmm. it's something great that needs to be addressed yeah, and we're going to figure it out so but we got to figure it out together and it, it's going to take some time i can yep. assure you that may i yes sir so one thing you said is confusing which was you didn't know if the board of selectmen have jurisdiction over that <clears throat> um so therefore who does so so which is why we were kind of urgent about this. Who, who, like, it's kind of baffling to me that there could be a trail being put in, and I don't, and the board of selectmen are saying they don't know who can stop it or who approved it. So if I could, Ms. Ms. Wright, it's okay. Mr. Uh, so land use rights, land use uh, decisions, a lot of that's planning board. Uh, so that's why I'm saying, I don't know whether it's a planning board issue or it's a board of selectmen issue, and it could be very well a board of selectmen issue, and maybe that's how it'll turn out. Um, but that's why I'd like to know what other towns do to manage their trails, and what, what, what governing um, uh, processes are in place to make it run far more smoothly than we have here. Uh, I know this is your folks' first time coming in officially and having a dialogue about these trails in your neighborhood. 10 years into this, this is about the 20th time this has happened, about trails in Hopkinton and our residents. So that tells me, 20 times later, we still got a problem here. If, if I may, um, so yesterday we had a meeting with Elaine, Norman, and Peter. We agreed that Peter, the Trails Club agreed that they would not do work on this property until um, the Board of Selectmen agreed that they could do it. Am I mischaracterizing what that discussion was, Elaine? I think. Um the agreement was to hold on the spur. Yes, I'm sorry, on the oh, spur, right. the deer run spur, right. agree. That agreement was made yesterday, so I just want to know, is that agreement binding? Yeah. The Trails Club is not part of the town, so 
what prevents us from leaving today and the trail is there tomorrow. So, so what I would suggest you, we do now is just, just table the back and forth and let the board yeah. do a little bit of work here and you guys can watch. Great. Uh, Thank you. I think we're ready to try and make some action. And, some and action I, I have my own comments. I want to turn to Mr. Ted Stone. Mr. Coutinho is, is whispering in my ear that there was some approval given. But again, I mean, I think the reason we're here tonight is even if there were approvals, if there are problems, nothing's been built yet. Nothing that says things can't be changed. Um, but specific to this spur, the Deer Run yes. Spur, we're calling it. Yes. That spur right now is proposed to be on the Hughes property. Well, the spur is proposed to be on the Deer, off the Deer Run. Right, but it's on the Hughes Going property. Going on to the Hughes property. And the reason for my question is the right. Board of Selectmen is the caretaker and owner of that land at this time. The Board of Selectmen does not own all the land in Topkinton. No. So we don't get, we can't control, to my point earlier, we can't control every piece of land and where trails go because some of the land we don't control. Right. Uh, so we do control that piece of land. Okay, so that's a good first step, I yep. think, is we recognize that and we can say, but I'd like to get some other input before we make a decision, that we can put that on hold tonight. Absolutely. Mr. Ted Stone. So I won't put my own personal <coughs> twist on this. Um, I'm sitting up here with strictly my selectman hat. And Mr. Hurt took my, uh, kind of stole my thunder where, sorry, you know, it's all right, you didn't know. Um, we're here just to do to uh, set policy and to enforce policy. So we have to create a policy before we can enforce one. Um, the one thing I will say is it's bothersome to me that this was a great presentation and it, it's great to see a neighborhood come together um, to, uh, to discuss an issue. <clears throat> There's intonations here to, to kind of vilify Peter Legoy and I don't like that at all. Peter's put a ton of years and a ton of hours. He doesn't have a, a horse in the game. He doesn't abut any property. He's here. He's strictly for P, for the uh, for the town, and he's not here for Peter Legoy. So when we call Peter out on certain issues, it really bothers me because you're trying to vilify him, and I don't like that at all. Um, other than that, you know, 35 years ago, like Mr. Hurst said. Things were a lot different. 35 years ago, in all your backyards, I was playing capture the flag and I was riding my bicycle long before your houses were there. Uh, we weren't happy when your houses went in. We weren't. We took away our snowmobile trails. We weren't able to get to Echo Lake to skate. But, you know, th there's evolution. I'm not here to impart my personal thoughts on all this. I'm, I strictly want to work on implementing policy, creating policy to implement, and to let it be known that I, as a selectman, certainly appreciate the work that Mr. Legoy has done. Doesn't mean I'm in Mr. Legoy's back pocket, doesn't mean that I agree with what he's saying, and, and I don't know a lot of the stuff that's gone on between you guys, but I know that he's put a lot of time and effort in here, and it's unfair to sit here and, and, and try to vilify him. That's it. Well, and that's my turn. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say that Everybody is right. The concerns and the, and the issues that are on both sides, if you will, and I don't even like to use the word side because it, it sounds divisive. <coughs> the concerns of the neighborhood are complete, legitimate concerns that are correct for you to have as homeowners and as members of a neighborhood that you treasure. And the people that want to expand the trail network, that work really hard, who you know, are trying to build these town assets to meet a town vision, that's a right objective, too, that we as a community have adopted. But I'm a strong believer that there's a place where you can understand the concerns on both sides, understand the needs, and find a middle ground. Um, Peter Lagoy is a town treasure. The amount of, I mean, he's a perfect example of what volunteerism can do for this town because hundreds of hours, which would translate into hundreds of dollars, and we see this throughout our town with all our volunteers, what is produced for this town by people that put in their time and effort. I mean, there was a trail a couple, back in, but we had a time crunch. December it had to get done by. We had a short window of time to get it done. We turn to Peter because we know Peter's the energizer bunny. He knows how to do it. He'll get it done, you know, and he did. And, and that's wonderful. And I don't want to lose that. 
but but at the same time, um, you know, I think the concern gets directed towards Mr. Legoy simply because he's he's the point person right now, and and your neighborhood deserves to have some degree of accountability when it's affecting you, and and honestly, the town as a whole, this. When this is through, however it goes, it's the creation of a town asset. It's a town asset, it's something that's going to carry liabilities for the town with, and it's completely fitting and proper that because it's the creation of a town asset, there should be some kind of accountability and communication so that this is done right. So I will say that sometimes you're in the unenviable position of it's kind of black and white. It's a, I win, you lose, or you win, you know, I lose. In this case, I really don't see that. I mean, I think we can have our cake and eat it too here because, you know, clearly there is, and, and you folks have already had some discussions with, with Elaine and the town manager, there clearly seems to be a, a method to use basically Granite Street and Hayden Row and into the Hughes property as the primary access point. The spur is a nice, or some people might think it's a nice extra, some people think it's a terrible extra. Doesn't look to me like it's a required extra in order to access this. Um, so, you know, I think, and you've already met with Mr. Lagoy. It appears that there has been some acknowledgement that the spur is not necessarily required. If there were no other way to get there, now we have a real conundrum. But it doesn't look like we do. Um, so, you know, th that's number one. It appears that the things that you're requesting about the spur not be under consideration should be doable for the town. Um, Mr. Lagoy will have plenty of work on his plate without the spur. Um, and, and I think that it's completely fitting that perhaps, uh, you know, you always say get out in writing. I can understand how in the short run we should codify, have some kind of a memorandum of understanding that codifies some of the discussions that have already been reached um, mm -hmm. so that the neighborhood has an assurance and we as a town have some you can't leave it to people's memories a couple years down the road. Let's put some of this down in, in a letter of understanding so we know where we are going forward. And then, and then I think that we should look as a town um, to find some, I don't want to use the word accountability, that, that, that sounds wrong, but some kind of a communication um, organization where when you're building town assets, um, there's a view, we shouldn't have gotten to this point. Um, but it brings up the point that that's where the need is um, and that we should um, work forwards, whether it's for starting, whether it's a board liaison. I think um, Mrs. Lazarus is probably as good a point person right now as you're, as you're going to get. She probably knows more than this board is <laughs> combined. If I may add, the trails groups have also requested the same thing. Yep. They have also requested coordination, oversight, uh, coordination of maintenance and those kinds of things, and I think that's important going forward to form that kind of process. We have an expanding trail network with miles of trails, and there are, um, you know, subsequent issues that are coming up, whether it's maintenance, whether it's, it's um, you know, accessibility. Um, so I think it's high time that we looked at that, whether it's, I don't want to lose the volunteer aspect at all, but I think it's high time that we looked at some kind of a different town organizational structure so that issues as they arise, um, there's a vehicle for addressing them. Um, and that probably takes some thought, but I certainly think from a short run, the kind of things that have already been agreed to, um, we, we can have our cake and eat it too here with access and, and getting some kind of, I would suggest, a, a, a memorandum of understanding right now. So I don't think we need an MO, MOU. Uh, well, I would maybe suggest that's the wrong that, word. Yeah, I think we just need to have a motion in the, in the a second and a vote on whether or not we want to proceed with this spur for the for the short term. But I, I think more importantly, I think we should also get a motion and in, in a, in a, in a second and a discussion and vote on directing the town manager's office to seek out best practices in Massachusetts for communities that manage trails well. Um, we've never done that, to my knowledge, and 
clearly, you know, we're still not sure who should do what here with the trails in Hockington, so we don't know. Um, and, and I think those would be two concrete actions we could take tonight to try and move this thing forward. That won't necessitate, that won't end the need for these concerned folks to keep the pressure on us to make sure we go figure that out and create some kind of governing body for trails. Um, nor would it necess, you know, end the need for people to participate in town meeting because we're gonna be buying more property to connect trails in Hopkinton and be, be aware of those issues and vote on them at town meeting uh, and speak to them at town meeting. Uh, so I, I guess I'm just concerned about an MOU. I don't, I don't think we've ever issued an MOU with any resident group in town. And that, maybe that's I used the wrong word. word. Okay, okay. Just something. Well, we can vote it. We can vote. vote. Something that codifies it. Well, one of the things, if, if I may, to the chair, the, um, you know, one of the things we can't lose is, uh, are the, the volunteers. And, and just in front of us just a few months ago um, was Mike Bolson, a volunteer who is the only real, other than Peter, one the only real organized person that takes care of all of our trails. We don't have a single dollar in a, in a trail budget for this town. For all the miles and miles of trails, we don't put in one single dollar for it. And he was just asking us to actually put some money in the budget, which this was a tough budget year, so I don't know if we did get any money into the budget. I'll have to check with him. A little. Okay, we got a little, but with all those miles of trails, and so that's you know, and and the Upper Charles Trails Committee, the only organized trails committee that we have in town, is approached constantly from all of these other places. You know, with what Brian was just saying, up in the neighborhood where we live, there there are trails that are never taken care of, and and, and you know, we've gone to the Upper Charles Trails State. Could you give us? They have some money, um, so they 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 gave us a a. a a, um, the outline of, char of a charge for a, for a uh, town-wide trails committee that would look at the, at the town as a whole as opposed to just the Upper Charles, which is just the, the an attachment from Ashland to Milford. That's the charge to make it, to somehow make it work and buy up enough properties to make it work. But to, to that point, you know, we have to, you know, again, work on that charge and see how we can do it for a more organized um, effect. Um, sir. I was just asked to, to step up because I had raised my hand. I wish to identify myself and just say a quick word before you do take a vote because I think there's some other people that have something to say before you guys decide something. So if you could take two minutes and just say something and then sit down and if there's anyone else, um, is that amenable? Sure. Your name? Uh, uh, John Spinelli, 42 Alexander Road. Mm -hmm. I've spoken in front of this board several times in reference to the trails. I live in the corner of Alexander and Joseph. And I wish this discussion had taken place last year because myself and several of the residents in Charlesview were before this board uh, several times. And I collected about 40 signatures of some of the people in Charlesview that were extremely concerned. So uh, more so, I wanted to know and let the residents of Deer Run and Blackstone know that they have, uh, Blackthorne, excuse me, have um, people on the other side of these trails that are just as concerned as they are. And I want to refresh the board's memory to let them know that there are several people in Charlesview that are just as concerned about the issues that these people have raised, that we brought up the exact same issues last year. So I think it's in fairness to everyone that if you're going to take into consideration and make a vote that you are gonna hold off on the deer run spur, that I ask the Board of Selectmen to consider holding off on all future spurs throughout the town until something can be devised where there is a plan in place where the people of the residents where these trails are going through will have a voice and that these trails so today it's not deer run or blackthorn or the coming through joseph it's going to be coming through another portion and other neighborhoods are going to be going through this i've been in you know watching and it's very difficult to keep track of all the hearings and all the meetings and all the votes and what's going to happen it takes a lot of time all of you have families, all of us have families. And to come here and just beat our heads against this table time and time again with the same issue, the vision of a few individuals is, might not be the vision of all these neighborhoods. And I don't certainly speak for everyone, but I do have a good sense of the community that I live in is opposed to this for the exact same reasons that were raised earlier. So in order to having to keep monitoring this time and time again until a proper p system is put in place by yourself or by another committee, that I ask that you guys take into consideration putting all of this on hold 
because I have a feeling if Deer Run is put on hold and Blackthorn's put on hold, tomorrow I'm gonna to be getting a voicemail from somebody else in the community that's gonna tell me, did you hear this trail now is gonna pop up? And I just don't have the time to keep chasing this. So in the interest of fairness, if you're gonna consider Deer Run, please consider what other trails might be on the table until you can figure out what needs to be done. Well, and I don't want to engage in back and forth. If I can make just one observation, um, you know, it's, it's truly unfortunate that way back when, when that rail bed was abandoned, the town was not able to secure that because the rail trails are ideal. No railroad ever went through anybody's house. You know, they were perfectly set up. That never happened. That right of way was sold off and broken up. And so this is an overall town objective. It's an overall town vision to create the system. And it's, it's, it's going to be, and it has been, a difficult sort of piecemeal progress, project trying to fit them in because of the amount of development. Um, and it's been slow, and Upper Charles Trail has been struggling with this. Um, I, I, some pieces of land probably lend themselves more readily to a compromise. I think in the case of Deer Run, it does, because there is the alternative to get in through Hayden Row without needing that. Um, but just speaking for myself, I, I would truly hesitate to put our entire trail program on hold because it's it's needing to be assembled bit by bit as we see where we can fit it in taking all these concerns in well let me clarify that the upper charles trail committee is tasked with getting a class a trail that is a trail that is handicapped accessible can be driven down by a road is over 10 feet wide you know has the abutments and the easements i'm i'm well familiar with that i've sat in those hearings as well mm -hmm. that's not what i'm looking I'm not concerned with that. They've been tasked with that, and I think they're doing a good job trying to, to do that. It's very difficult. I understand the limitations that they have, but people just don't want this in their backyard. My concern is these lower class trails that uh, the running clubs and some of the other people in town have, have tried to kind of um, put in where they might necessarily affect some of the residents in these neighborhoods. Some people are for them. Some people are against them. I get that. There's two sides to the story. All I'm asking is that a long time ago, this, what you have discussed over the last hour, should have been implemented. And I'm just asking you that tonight, if you implement such a thing, that you consider this a town-wide thing and not just limit it to the people on Deer Run and limit it uh, to Granite or maybe even some of the areas in, um, in Charleview that have been targeted by these committees to put these smaller, lower class stone dust or even grass trails until we can figure out a proper way of who has the right to manage these trails, who has the right and, and how we can negotiate how these trails are, are going to be put in and properly maintained. Because uh, frankly, not enough people know about it. And when you hear about it, it's kind of a last minute thing and you're scurrying to kind of get down and figure out where they're going to go. And every time you look at something, there's a different map. Mm -hmm. So until we can get organized and figure out what's going on, I'm more so concerned about the smaller stone dust trails. The Upper Charles is doing their own thing, and that, like I said, is a Class A trail. It's completely different than what we're discussing tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. So um, well, a couple of thoughts. I mean, town manager, um, town meeting runs the show in Hockington. We don't run the show. Town meeting runs the show. Town meeting has bought land and said put a trail on there. Mm -hmm. So in those particular parcels, we have no authority or right to say, no, we're going to stop that. Okay, so that, that piece of the puzzle, in my view, is off the table because we're not in charge of that. Town meeting's in charge of that. And members that attend make those votes. Um, any situation where we're tying into other land and we're adding a spur going into a neighborhood, things like that, I think we can mm -hmm. weigh in on without disrupting town meeting's intent, which was to put a trail on a huge property, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I don't want to say we're not going to do a do. I don't think we can lawfully say we're going to just stop huge trail because that's no. not what town meeting said. And town meeting is our boss, right? And we yeah. can't stop we can't stop trails and land we don't own. Uh, own. If it's halted right. and, exactly. and, and yes. other lands that we don't own or, or we don't control, 
we can't tell them right okay so how about if we tried to move this along a little bit uh, I would put a motion on the table that the Board of Selectmen uh, charge the town manager's office with seeking out and uh, gathering or reaching out and gathering you'll clean this up right? reaching out and gathering uh, significant uh, trail management processes or successful trails and trail management processes uh, throughout across the state where obvious uh, trail networks exist and are managed by a single entity in the community and to report back to the Board of Selectmen by October 1st their findings I think we have to start there because mm -hmm. we just really just don't the know what's the right way to yep. do this I'll second that <clears throat> motion and a second on the table so, just the one thing I want to I'm not against what you're saying in any way shape or form I think uh, what I wanted to kind of add to it is the uh, about our rights and uh, determine from other communities what about our rights exist to town owned trails and when there's gonna be something that's uh, something that's proposed and, and how that's managed I would include that as a friendly amendment to my motion how the other communities manage that? Yeah. How they manage the rights concerns. I'll second that as well. So just to comment on the on the motion and the reason for it. So this, in my view, um, begins to address the macro picture right. of what's going to happen to the trails below John's house and what's going to happen to the trail that may or may not go on Deer Run and what's going to happen to the trail that may or may not go on Todaro. Who's going to manage it? Where's the money going to flow from? All those kinds of things we've got to start to figure out because it's time to get it under control, including the Upper Charles Trails Committee and their end of pro, you know the end of life committee work, what they're going to report out to the board of selectmen someday mm -hmm. soon, soon mm -hmm. too. So all that would be encompassing in this overall process, and then we put a strategy together from October one through the end of the year as to what we think we should put together, and then we put the trail committee together, whatever it's going to be called, go from there. And presumably that would also include some sort of a structure for neighbors when they have concerns, an entity that they could come to to get some of that addressed or at least brought up before it reaches crisis stage. Right. And I also want people to know that, that on the Upper Charles Trails Committee, we really take it all to heart. It, and when you were talking about Charles View, one of the, one of the, it, it's, there's almost been a two-year delay in how, on, on what we were going to do and what lands were available to buy in order to try and make it work, to try and work with the people at, at Charles View. You know, and so we really do listen to everybody on, on the Upper Charles Trails Committee to make sure that every, we do have the buy-in. So it really is important to, to hear everybody speak, and, 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 and it is heard. It's just it's so frustrating to, you know, to, to get a little piece and say, oh, this might be able to work. Okay, if we can just buy this 50-foot piece, we might be able to attach something. And I mean, that, that, that it's such a convoluted trail, that, but we're trying to make it work. So. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Herr. It has been seconded. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, it's unanimous. And would we like to make some kind of a motion, as you suggested, Mr. Herr, to codify the agreement that was informally reached between Mr. Legoy, he's raising his hand, um, about not creating the spur through Deer Park. Madam Chair, if it's okay with you, before we get into, at least from my perspective, before we get into a motion perhaps on that Deer Run Spur, we've heard from the residents who are concerned. I'd be interested in hearing Mr. Legoy's perspective on this trail as well, or the spur. Absolutely. And then maybe two minutes maximum because we get it. We don't need a yep. whole dissertation yep. here. Uh, and then uh, we can go from there. Mr. Legoy. If, if, I, if, I, if I may also, we, you know, we, let's also get some input from Upper Charles. You know, that's, it's, you know, the, from the chair of Upper Charles, just to make sure what, if there was, you know, what the intentions also, before we have to be, I think we should be. Well, we can just put a moratorium on it right now tonight yeah. after we okay. hear, and then we can change it three weeks from now if we decide to change it. It doesn't mean it's in forever. Because they, 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 they don't have any representation there. 
other than, other than our liaison. But I, I mean, I would add with all due respect that um, the point is this piece of Hughes property is totally accessible on a major public thoroughfare without going through a neighborhood. So it's not a situation where you can't get there without doing this. So that's why I'm feeling this is this is one that we could take off the table. Mr. Legoy. Okay, Peter Legoy, 21 Hayden Row. Um, first of all, I want to say that this, while it has my name on it, is not my plan. So <laughs> let me start with that. With regard, and I'll speak, the Hughes Trail, um, you know, initially was going to go from Joseph, but I was seeking money to go from Joseph, and in working with the neighbors, we decided to not do that end of the trail. So that trail remains sort of as a, a wooded path right now for pedestrian only. What we're talking about is a multi-use trail, um, stone dust surface, similar to what's on the center trail, um, going from 192 Hayden Row, the Hughes property, to a turnaround at the end of the Hughes property, not getting into Joseph Road. There's a lot of wetlands in there at this point. Um, so then the question becomes the spur trail. And our plan was to have a stone dust path going out that would be ADA compliant. The idea being to have connectivity for people who want to get to other areas. The Echo Trail we just finished up. Again, another stone dust trail. And so to have people using that. I don't ever, I mean, you've got a half mile trail at the Echo Trail. This is about three tenths of a mile. I don't see people parking as to someone's point in the middle of that to walk that. What people will do as they do on Center Trail, and if you, if you know the parking there, there's only about eight spaces and there, you know, there's never a problem with those spaces there. So I don't, I don't see parking being a huge issue. I think it's a huge perception issue. And so that needs to be dealt with. And I think to your point, having a, a way to deal with this politically is a great way to go. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like to be addressing these issues on a regular basis. I really don't. Um, so, back to the, to the spur trail out to Deer Run. In thinking about that and talking with the neighbors, one of the things I suggested was we leave that grass strip that you saw as is um, and not, basically not build a trail. That's what we talked about um, at yesterday's meeting and I think we all agreed that made sense. The only caveat to that, and this is from a construction point of view only, is that crossing a stream such as the um, stream that's behind 192 Hayden Row may be problematic. There's a little farm bridge over it right now. Clearly that old farm bridge used to be wooden ties. Somebody, probably Dave, David Hughes, took the granite slabs and stuck those down. Um, in order to get material in here, we're probably looking 30 dump trucks. We're not talking a, a lot of, of truckloads, mm -hmm. but crossing that bridge may be really problematic. Um, so that, that's just an issue, and that's the one thing I would like to leave open. I agree that we want to codify maybe um, you know, not building the spur at this point, just like we're not building the spur at the other end. Um, you know, but there all also needs to be a, a way to say, okay, we'll let trucks come in in order to be able to build the, the trail that runs across Hughes, um, but then make sure it gets put back the way it is. Um, there would probably be, from looking at it, there would be some tree clearing that would be required from that, but it doesn't need to be extensive, I don't think. And, then, and I, I typically leave that up to the construction guys. Um, the guy I typically use, I do tend to need to control him a little bit. Sometimes he gets going, but we flag trees and make sure that it isn't a problem. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, so we want to leave that open. That's the only thing I would, mm -hmm. sort of the caveat to that. That did come up at the meeting, at the end of that last meeting, and you know, certainly I apologize for that, but that's sometimes the way a construction project works. You've got to try and think of all the, the pieces, and you don't want to end up leaving yourself not able to do something because of, you know, a, a wetlands issue or something like that. I mean, we don't, we bought that Hughes property. It is under your guys' direction, under the direction of the selectmen for active and passive recreation. So you do have control over it. Uh, but we don't want to cut off use of that whole property because on 
the other end on Joseph, there's a lot of wetlands, and because there's a stream on this end, when there is an upland access through that through that deer run. That deer run spur was put in back in 1986 for access to this property. So it's all town owned land. Peter, can I just ask, um, how long a time frame do you think it would be that you'd need to be using that for uh, construction vehicle entry number one? And would there be any preparation of the, of the surface or would they just like go all over onto the grass and then we'll restore the sod afterwards? That part I don't know. I talked to the construction guys. They, they would tell me. Um, about but, the surface? Well, about the, sur the surface. Yeah. In terms of length of time, um, when they're actually bringing material in for three tenths of a mile trail, we're probably talking a couple of weeks, something mm -hmm. like that. They do a lot of work getting the, the surface cleared, and then they bring the material and they, they typically go pretty quickly. I can't, I can't remember what it was on Acro Trail, which would probably be the, the most recent example. But then would they need to continue going in to be doing the construction? They would typically they'd move um, a couple of s small pieces of equipment in to do that work. Then they'd run run the material in, um, and then those they would do the finish with that with the piece of equipment. But then they could come back out. But you probably want to leave it open for a while. We got you know typically you put down uh, road based material as well as stone dust material, and that's two separate uh, excursions. And then they'd restore it. Yeah. When they're through. Yep. Then we can restore it back to grass. Mr. Her? So, so we have to figure out if this deer run spur could take the weight of some trucks going in there to drop the materials, is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. and we have to figure, see if that would work, right? They're gonna, if trucks are gonna go into deer run, they're not gonna go over some beat up old bridge it's going to implode into some stream that we that, would prefer not that to just not sounds like that. a disaster in the making and we're not going to be able to rebuild the bridge because it's over wetlands and that's about three years of yada 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 so, so I, I told the neighbors i would certainly look at what options there are and again that's talking to the construction folks and saying gee how is there is there a way to do this that's not crazy expensive and so I'll get that information. If we had if we had timbers around or if timbers could be used for that, I just I just don't know. But to fortify that bridge over an existing wetland mm. uh, without going to conservation commission and going down that hole, rat hole, uh, is just only going to delay we're things. Going here. to conservation anyway, so we're it's already just a tough process. situation because of that bridge and its condition yes. and trucks and so on. So. So here's what I would suggest, having heard that sort of other piece of the puzzle here, or other perspective, is that we put a hold on any development of the deer run spur until we understand from the construction company how they can access to, to get into the Hughes property trail so that that can get built per town meeting, right? That's mm -hmm. That's town meeting's decision. Um, and then once we understand how the construction can access the Hughes property trail, <coughs> then we can make a decision about what we would do, if anything, allowing the construction vehicles to access Deer Run right. for that right. temporary period of time. Right. Because I'm not convinced of, uh, uh, I don't know what size trucks you're talking about here, but I'm not convinced a big dump truck like the ones Johnny's got are gonna be blowing over a grass thing here and not destroying it and getting stuck in there in about a day. I'm just envisioning a big, huge truck. I don't Who's know bringing your dirt to you? Um, I've had McIntyre, but usually uh, there's a local guy in name escapes me right now. But he's usually bringing, you know, using 10 wheelers. 10 rows, so 18 um, yards at a shot. But we can, we can sometimes use a smaller truck. And again, I can work with a... Yeah, so maybe that would be Scott the answer. The guy oh, yeah, yeah. But yep. a smaller truck, Peter, might get over that bridge safely. Mm -hmm. That's already existing, and we don't have to worry about cons conservation commission. Right. You know, so let's try that too. If we could, that yeah, would well, work, that, that would be some idea. of the options I'd, I'd want to look at and talk to these guys. And of course, they have their preferred, faster, cheaper method. But I think sometimes they can be pushed a little bit. So that's you know, and that's what I sort of agreed with the neighbors that I would certainly go ahead and do that. Going over that bridge is the preferred method at this point, but I just don't want to exclude the deer run. And I certainly feel fine coming back to you guys and saying. You know, we've looked at the bridge, it's not going to work. Can we use the deer run and asking for that second level of permission? Okay. So, Madam Chair, if I could, 
I move that the Board of Selectmen, being the owners and uh, caretakers of the Hughes property uh, in Hopkinton, uh, place a moratorium on the development of the so-called Deer Run Spur uh, in any form, or use of the Deer Run Spur in any form, until we get definitive information from the construction company or construction individuals, whatever, uh, how they're going to access the dropping trail building materials on the Hughes property trail. Additionally, can they access the Hughes property trail crossing the bridge that currently exists? Is that safe? And additionally, understanding the deer run proposed deer run spur, how that may or may not impact the Upper Charles Trails Committee and their work to date. If we get those three pieces of information, we'll be further down the path. I'm sorry, I'm defending my own motion. So that's the motion. So <laughs> I will second it um, with, well, I will second it. And I just want to assure, oh, I want to, through the chair, I would like to, to not minimize Mr. Spinelli's comments on the work saying, so say we say now you can't work at Deer Run, well now you're gonna go, you know, full bore down at Joseph Road. I don't want I don't want the perception and I don't think that you'll do that. I, I trust you with, with all my heart. I've known you long enough to, to trust you um, at your word. Um, but I just want to recognize that Mr. P Mr. Spinelli's concerns will be taken under consideration as, as well. That would be a wetland nightmare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just had a clarification on the motion. If when you say use it in any form, does that mean for construction purposes or if a mountain biker wants to go through this? So we're not prohibiting some member of the public yeah. from No, it's public in. land. No, I'm talking so about to develop the trail right. or use it. Yeah, for so this project. for this project, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to your point about following your second, I think we're in deliberation now. Um, there's a there's a turnaround at the end of this huge property trail now. There's not a connection to Joseph. Okay. Yeah. So that has stopped, and that's been okay. discussed prior. Um, so now, if I could just defend the motion a little bit, uh, all I'm trying to do is understand the concerns of the residents, and then get some more information that this board can then use to determine what's the best way to continue the work of town meeting. Uh, but we don't think we have all the facts just yet. Right. Mr. Herb, um, I understand your motion relative to construction, need for construction access, but I don't understand your motion bringing in the work of the Upper Charles Trails, because it looks pretty clear to me, looking at this, that there is total access to the Hughes property, which would connect to whatever else through Hayden Row and Granite Street, wherever the Upper Charles Trails Trail goes, I don't see why there's any need for that little deer run spur relative to the Upper Charles. I, I don't know either, Mrs. Wright. I'm just suggesting that we get their input because they've spent a lot of time looking at all these possibilities over the last several years, and I'd hate to sort of keep them out of the discussion, given that we're going to try this other issue of really getting our head around the trails in Hopkinton on a holistic basis. But just, it just looks to me like the deer run spur is one thing that can be comfortably taken off the table for a permanent trail because yeah, whatever just, Charles I don't needs know. to do, but he I, shouldn't need that. Gets him to the same sure. spot. In, the chair, I, in support of the motion, I think that we should never deny expertise um, coming in. You know, someone who's been working on this for the past nine years, potentially seven years. Um, I think getting that expertise and that uh, that input would be helpful. I agree that just from looking at this, that I don't see why we need the spur, but um, at the same time, I'd be interested in finding out why. Why maybe we do. Um, I can't think of a reason at the moment, but maybe the Upper Trails could, Upper Charles Trail Committee does have some information. It just seems to me that that's the crux of the issue that's before us with the neighborhood. And removing that concern would probably address the lion's share of the problem that we're dealing with tonight. No, actually, we're just putting it through the chair. We're, going, we're talking about a 
moratorium until we get some more information. Right. And then and then after we hear from all three entities, then, then I think we can make an informed decision, as opposed to right now, we're doing what sometimes happens to us at town meeting floor, where, where a year's worth of meetings happen, and then somebody says, amend that and change an entire year's worth of work. And, and, and can, uh, you know, and this is this is several years worth of work, and we just want to make sure that there's not a uh, an, an issue. Somewhere. And maybe by the time, maybe by the time we get all the information specific to, you know, the construction companies, the bridge, the Upper Charles Trails Committee, etc., we'll be down the path a little bit with this holistic view of how we should manage the trails too. And who knows, maybe the stars will align for once with Trails and Hopkinton, we'll get our head around it all at one time. I don't know. But I think we should just, there's nothing's going to, the world's not coming to an end tomorrow if this thing is not developed as a dust trail tomorrow, correct? As far as I know. Okay, good. The center trail's awesome, by the way. I ran the other day. I just love it over there. Um, anyway. All right, there is a motion on the table. It has been seconded by Mr. Ted Stone. That's right. That correct? That's right. Mrs. Lazarus, do you want to read that back to us? Can you do that? <laughs> it's been a long yeah. time. <laughs> and the words to the effect that the Board of Selectmen, being the owners and caretakers of the Hughes property, place a moratorium on the Deer Run Spur in any form or for use of it in any form for this project until the Board gets definitive information from the construction company on how they'll access the uh, used property to do the materials and construction work, and um, if they can access it via the bridge that currently exists, which is the priority um, or first preference, mm -hmm. and also to understand the deer run spur, how it might affect the Upper Charles Work Trail Trail Committee work to date. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Herc. And thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. And moving along a little late, we have done our liaison reports already. The only thing remaining is the town manager's report. And Mrs. Lazarus, you're filling in for Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Malo, and I think you have another agenda item. Right. So we have one item that was not known to the chair at the time the agenda was created. Okay. And um, that is the means-tested um, senior tax relief program, which is going through the legislature as it nears the end of the legislative section, session. So, Claire, I think there's a statement for you to read as far as the... Uh, I can pass that to you if you... Ah, uh, I have that, don't I? About it not being on the agenda. Oh, oh, okay. All right. I have a motion for the, yeah, for the. Oh, here, no, I have it right here. Okay. Okay. The chair did not anticipate that the means tested senior tax relief legislation would need to be on the agenda this evening. Late yesterday, staff received word from Representative Dykema's office that the committee on bills in the third reading requires that the board vote the entire redrafted language of the bill so that it can move forward. The board must act quickly as the legislative session is drawing to a close. The board previously reviewed and discussed at a public meeting the changes that are in the redrafted language. And this is a very good thing to help our seniors. We've been looking for things to aid them in their tax in their tax situation, and I see the town clerk, Mr. Um, <laughs> you have something you'd like to add, Connor, Mr. Deacon? If you don't mind, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to really briefly check, if this was yesterday, was there a reason that no revised agenda was posted? It was evening, <laughs> so it was, I think, after hours. Okay. Um, but, but what I about even this morning here? Um, I just didn't curiosity. consider, I, I thought that within the 48 hours we could not have a revised agenda. It's nice to print a revised agenda, but not required. Right. I thought we weren't so to do that. So the, the new uh, regulations on open meeting law do state that it can be revised if it was not anticipated. It just needs to include the date that it was revised. 
And it wasn't confirmed until I spoke with the um, representative's aide today. Okay, I was just, I just wanted, I was just curious. Thank you. Okay. So the representative's aide did indicate it goes to each of these committees, and they all have their separate requirements. It's the same language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're running short on time, so it's sort of an emergency thing. I'm glad Mr. G is keeping us honest. Yes, and thank you, Connor. Thank you, Connor. Mr. Katina, would you like to make the motion? I request a motion to approve the redrafted language of H4389, an act authorizing the town of Hopkinton to establish a means-tested senior citizen property tax exemption. So I requested the motion, but you're making it. I'm making it. Is there a second? I'm going to second that. Second. Any discussion? Questions? All right. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? It's unanimous. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. And that's it for town manager's mm -hmm. report. That's it. Okay. Um, are there other future agenda items that the board would like to uh, discuss at a future date? I have a quick one. I would like to find out what the process or what the uh, status is of the uh, DPW. Uh, mm. I don't know why the Tom, Thomas McIntyre, why the, the letters are not, and I don't know why we haven't uh, had a grand opening yet. I will find out. I'd like to find out on that. He said he wanted to do a soft opening and then a big DP, opening in DPW the fall. week was May. He was he, he told us in the in the winter that he wanted to do a soft, um, he wanted to hold off until May when it was DPW week. Oh, well. uh, he did not say May 2018. I was assuming that he meant 2018. <laughs> uh, it bothers me to drive by and not see the name on there. So is that an agenda item so much, or just want Mr. Westerling to? I just want him to step up and get it done. So we'll put it on the agenda, unless we don't need to. Unless acting town manager can get that done. Okay. Spur and dash. Spur. <laughs> I don't want to go down that path. He's <laughs> asked acting town manager. We've rode that trail tonight. <laughs> get an answer for us, and she could yes. present that in the town manager's report, so, probably, perhaps. Sure. How are Excellent the decision, okay. Madam Chair. Right. Excellent work. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Nick. I have one. Um, so I was actually talking to my brother um, about, he's in, he's in the biotech industry, and we were talking about um, South Street and what would ever happen if we lost our, our favorite uh, tech industry there. Um, and he had mentioned that towns uh, could become Gold Star certified, meaning uh, kind of getting the infrastructure or the bylaws in order to allow for the biotech industry to we are, actually come. We already are gold. We, we are. did that three years ago. Okay. Yep, buy already gold. Buy already yep. gold, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I guess I don't have one. Guess <laughs> not. <laughs> but has it been used to his point? <laughs> well, yeah, we haven't we haven't been called on it at this point. I, so I'll I, second that. <laughs> I, I've I've got a couple with um, uh, us moving back into the uh, town hall. I want to see if we can again look at uh, any additional parking. Um, and uh, do a review on, on, on uh, municipal parking if there's uh, something we can buy, something we can do, because we are going to run into uh, an issue because we do only have a, a few s leased spots there, or whatever it's, our agreement is. And um, also, if we could uh, have uh, Mr. Westerling come in and discuss the strategic plan for the uh, DPW. Um, and, uh, mostly in reference to the uh, the trees issue that was brought to our attention by uh, Mr. Regan um, a couple weeks ago. So we hit trails, trees, and uh, let's just stay away from trash. <laughs> trash. <laughs> and that's all I've got. He wanted to say. Okay. All right. No other items from everyone. Um, I would entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. adjourn. Is there so a second? second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. We're, we're signing. meeting will be we signing. signing. Yeah. I think our next meeting is what? Just the bond stuff. 19? Claire has the bond stuff. I have the bond stuff. Okay. 